Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, and it's very nice to be here to speaking to such a, what you might call, inter uh, international audience uh, about a topic which is dear to my heart. Um, I think two things to say at the beginning of this uh, talk. First of all, uh, I've uh, long learnt that actually getting people to listen to anything for uh, uh, half an hour, let alone an hour, and they've given me an hour and 15 minutes, in fact, is quite a struggle. So at various stages, I'm going to get you to do one or two activities just to check that you're still with me and engaged. Okay. Uh, also, uh, I do, do like to give you the opportunity to come <coughs> back at me. I do have a particular position. You may have questions, you may have comments, you may want to criticise what I say, that's fine. So I'll try and give you a slot at the end. Uh, so if you've got particular burning issues uh, as I uh, uh, go along, uh, do note them down and your time and opportunity will come. Uh, I think I'm here because um, some time ago uh, I read a book with Jerry Wellington on this topic of language and literacy in science education. Uh, I, uh, as somebody who I think occupied a position uh, in the English system, although I, uh, of questioning the extent to which we engage in the amount of practical work uh, in schools and what the purpose of it is. Now, I've always got to qualify that because I'm conscious that as soon as you go right around the world, there are lots of places where they do no practical work, okay, where the opportunity is very minimal, and I do think that practical work is important. But also what I think is important in this particular context is the opportunity to think about language in science and why it matters. Now, I want to start with a little quiz, uh, uh, first of all. Uh, it's useful to me to know how many people here teach science in one form or, uh, or another, could I just have a hands up and see how many people teach science? Okay, about two, roughly two-thirds of you. Okay. Now, this is a question for those of you who teach science. The rest of you is just really of empirical interest. Okay. Um, those of you who teach science, okay, hands on hearts, honestly, okay, okay, how many of you really think it's somebody else's job to teach them to read and write? <laughs> hands on heart, okay? <laughs> I'm not sure how honest they're being. Okay. Okay. Let's try another question. Okay. Hands on heart. How many of you really think it's somebody else's job to teach them mathematics or math, as they say uh, in the USA where I am now? Hands on heart. Let's have a look. Hands up. Okay. Okay. Well, I th think you're an exceptional audience, actually, because I think, uh, as we wrote in this book, uh, traditionally, uh, I think you'll find most science teachers don't have a lot of concern for literacy. Uh, they see it as being somebody else's job. Okay? <coughs> Their job is to teach them science. Okay? Reading, writing, mathematics is somebody else's job. And I'm here to try and persuade you otherwise. Uh, this is the kind of basic argument that I actually want to make. First of all, I think literacy is fundamental to science. You cannot engage in science without reading, writing, and more. Okay? And there are particular problems about the nature of that kind of language that you have to engage with. And it helps when you're teaching science to be aware of those particular problems because I think it will make you, hopefully, a better uh, science teacher. Now, the second point I want to make is that being scientifically literate is more than just knowing the content. Okay? It's more than just knowing what the words mean. Because actually, what you have to do as somebody who's reading scientific textbooks or if you're a scientist who's reading, is you have to construct meaning from the text. And that is a much more complex operation than just knowing what the individual words mean. And I hope to illustrate this uh, to you later on. And then finally, okay, or, or third, really um, the final point here, is that primary access to science is through texts. This is the way in which most people come to know science. I know they spend lots of time in your classroom, and you're all fascinating, brilliant teachers, and they listen to you in a riveted kind of way. But actually, if you think about it, most of us have spent an awful lot of time poring over textbooks, writing, reading, thinking, or, or discussing it in that kind of way. And those texts are quite important. They're particularly important in the scientific world where scientists spend an awful lot of their time reading papers or writing papers. So teaching, my conclusion then here is that teaching uh, how to read science or how to write science is teaching science. And that's the position I'm coming from. Uh, clearly, if you want to argue about that, I'm very happy uh, for, to engage in that discussion. Uh, and for me, that position, I think, is articulated by one of the leading communicators of science. Uh, uh, this is Montgomery. 
uh, he's written a book on the Chicago Guide to Communicating Science, on what does he actually have to say. He says, science exists because scientists are writers and speakers. We know this, if only intuitively, from the very moment we embark upon a career in biology, physics, or geology. I don't know what happened to chemistry. <laughs> As a shared form of knowledge, scientific understanding is inseparable from the written and spoken word. There are no boundaries, no walls between the doing of science and the communication of it. Communicating is the doing of science. Research that never sees the dark of print remains either hidden or virtual or non-existent. Publication and public speaking are how scientific wound gains a presence, a shared reality in the world. Uh, and you uh, had a, an earlier reference to the uh, uh, origin of the species, which has been the seminal text, which has had profound influence uh, on the whole of what you might call contemporary thinking. And that's how these things are communicated. Uh, and so in the context of science, texts are fundamentally key. Now you might say to me, well, that's science. Okay, science education is a different thing, okay? and I am particularly one of the people who tries to try and point this out, that actually doing science and learning science are not the same thing. But actually, I am going to argue that in the context of learning science, learning how to engage with language and text is fundamental and key.